Welcome back. After a small hiatus, FRC Roundup is back and prepping for the upcoming 2025 FRC season. We have a great guest and four topics to cover tonight that have emerged over the past couple weeks in the community, looking into a teaser release and some hot discussion points currently in the community. All of this and more coming up on this episode of FRC Roundup. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Welcome to the show. If you have not caught our show previously, FRC Roundup is where we take important topics currently happening in FRC, highlight some discussion points about events that may have happened, strategy, or really anything that correlates with FRC. If you're the fun community, think that there is a topic that we should discuss on FRC Roundup, please feel free to ping me in the fun Discord. I'll be more than happy to take a look at it. If you're not familiar with me, my name is Nick Mathis, currently in the first in Michigan region and I'm a mentor on Team 33, the Killer Bees. And I'm Connor McBride, mentor for Team 166 Chop Shop and an MC and game announcer in the New England district. Our guest today is Ryan Swanson. Ryan is a multi-time guest here on this show, fun correspondent and mentor on 6045 Sabre Robotics. Ryan, welcome to the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, always good to have Ryan on. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump right into our first topic of the night. Going to be talking about the 2025 Rescape trailer. Uh, the one on Rescape, that's going to be a hard one to say. Um, but yeah. um, jumping into the trailer that was released, um, I believe it was a couple weeks ago. Um, first put out, um, you know, the about minute and a half video, kind of trying to, you know, put some hints in there about maybe next year's game and what we can expect coming here um, in Geez, like we're looking at six weeks to kick off. That's that's crazy to look at. But um, yeah, so uh, one of the thing, one of the big points that I took out of it, um, it's probably about forty five seconds into the video when there's a bunch of robots that are underwater and um, placing these these specific items um, that look like to be I can't exactly tell. I think it's you could call it a buoy of some sort or whatever you want to call it into. Um, it looks like some sort of apparatus in the ocean. I think you know first is really um, highlighting some sort of pick and place game. I think we're due for one. Um, coming up here now that it has uh, been a bit since we've had one, you know, the past um, 2022, we had a, you know, shooting game 2023. Uh, we had a shooting and pick and place game, I guess, because some people were shooting the cubes 2024, obviously full shooting game. So I, I expect to get back to, you know, the, the, uh, the pick and place realm here um, coming up with the 2025 season. Um, it is the first year back that we'll have two game pieces. Um, first it announced that, yeah, this right here was shown on screen. Um, but, it, you know, first it announced that we're going to be going back to two game pieces, which props to first for um, getting that out there. But, Ryan, Connor, what are your, um, you know, overall thoughts about the trailer that have been posted and what we could uh, possibly look for in this year's game? For sure, yeah, no, I'm getting strong 2019 vibes. Uh, pick and place, two game pieces. Um, I mean, like that, the last time we did that was 2019. Uh, I've got my kids and my CAD team. I, I told them, hey, go build an elevator. Go CAD an elevator. Have a good plan for that. Um, so high, high level, I think it'll be 2019. From the teaser video, my big takeaway was the four robots at the end uh, collaborating to lift the whatever they're lifting. Um, there are only three robots on an alliance. There are four robots kind of shown there doing stuff. Uh, it would not shock me by any stretch for... Uh, the, either the end game or some kind of co-op involving both alliances, if not four robots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, actually, I didn't actually pick up on that. Counter any thoughts? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat as Ryan. So on 166, we're also doing an off-season project to uh, to design an elevator. Like we haven't done one since 2019, and we haven't been that effective in it in the the years that I've been around. So we really want to have that in our back pocket so that if we believe that this game needs an elevator, we can just take that design that we've been working on or, or piggyback off of that and continue to work on that. Um, I, what I found interesting is that when they pan to all those robots looking around the ocean floor, one of them is on a tether. So that kind of made me maybe think mini bots, maybe potentially. Oh boy. Yeah. Start and the then, narrative. <laughs> I want <laughs> 
I, I want to experience Minibot and I want to I want an inner tube game. Yeah, mini that, mini bots with uh, the new minion motors, right? Is that what I'm hearing? That would be cool. <laughs> Connor, you're yeah. saying you want 2011 all over again? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't around for 2011, but I mean, it looked like a fun game. I'll take it. Maybe maybe it'll change the point values around so mini bots aren't so overpowered. For, uh, yeah, for I think around in place, 20, but... 2012 was my first exposure to first, and uh, 2011 looked pretty cool. I'll give them that. Uh, my votes for 2019. I'm gonna vote. Uh, we're gonna get something akin to 2019 with a more open field. Yeah, and the they it, the robots were manipulating some form of game piece that went into that cube as well. Looks like some kind of cylindrical object with a handle on it. So whether if that's some form of like PVC pipe or something, that would be a pretty interesting game piece because I, I believe headquarters said in there in the uh, blog post for the two game pieces um that one of them is a can be easily sourced uh at, like any kind of like local stores and yeah, stuff like that, that. So, yeah so like the, wh when i heard that it was like hardware stores are like very abundant throughout the u.s and very consistent so that's mm. pvc is a very common thing so maybe something like that i don't know that'd be kind of cool but i mean we'll find out january 4th yeah very interested to see um, this will be like, a, you know, Ryan said this, well, I guess 2023 we two game pieces too. So it hasn't been that long, but um, it's, you know, it's another dip into the, the two game piece um, era, which, you know, obviously brings its own complexity, um, you know, to the robots and stuff like that. So I'll be very curious to see what first release, they always do a good job of uh, leading us in the wrong direction um, and then giving us a, a curveball. So, <laughs> but we'll see what comes out of it. Um, jumping into our next topic of the night, we're going to be talking about new FRC products. Um, obviously, with the blog post coming out um, in, uh, I believe it was the end of October. It wasn't October. Um, with the, the new products coming out, um, looking at um, new control system products, new motors, new motor controllers, stuff like that coming out from various vendors with a lot on the horizon. So uh, a few things that I wanted to highlight, and then we'll kind of go around the table and maybe hear about um, what some of the other folks on the show are liking a lot. Um, you know, two big things uh, from West Coast Products and CTR Electronics coming out with the, the new Kraken X44. Um, you know, it looks to be a smaller size Kraken uh, to be used in essentially various places. Um, seems to be one of the other, another top tier motor entering the FRC market. Um, also on the motor range, the, the Minion coming from CTR Electronics is a sole um, motor without um, having a direct uh, controller attached to it. We saw Thrifty Bot, Thrifty Bot release their Thrifty Nova that they were um, debuting or, uh, you know, at least had on display at Champs uh, this past year. Uh, Roverbotic Servo Hub. Um, the big thing that I thought was super interesting, um, CTR has really come out with a lot of products, um, you know, over the past couple of weeks. Candy, the Can Range, the Talon FXS. The big one that I thought was super interesting was the PDP 2.0. Um, I was curious to see that that had come out. Um, you know, with meeting the new ATO breakers, that platform, um, and having no can on it, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and to be honest, I'm actually a, a pretty big fan of it not having can. I know that might be a semi unpopular opinion, but the the new PDP having, or the this new CTR PDP have not having can on it, I thought was super interesting um, coming out from the community. Um, obviously also expecting Andy Mark to have some new products out early December from what they've been posting on Chief Delphi. And then I'm assuming, um, you know, Rebel have something up as well too. Um, you know, they, I think they usually tend to be around that December time frame. So um, expect, you know, something to come out of both of those great suppliers. But uh, yeah, the big, the big one for me that I thought was super interesting was the PDP 2.0 um, along obviously with the new motors that came in as well. But um, Ryan, what are you guys uh, looking at 6045? What are some new products that are exciting you guys? Yeah, I want to shout out Ryan Donio with Thrifty Bot, Thrifty Nova. Um, I've been aware of the existence of that motor controller since early on in the development. I think mm -hmm. probably a year and a half, two years now. I know he's put a ton of work into it, uh, and I hope the community adopts it, and I, I think it's super cool. Um, so, yeah, rooting for Ryan there. Uh, 6045 just got announced as hashtag Team Rev, uh, throwing that out there too. Oh, so, I know cool. Rev, they have done their – yeah, yeah, super excited year two for us, and – uh, Rev, they haven't done their big product drop yet. Uh, they, there was some hints that there's going to be some stuff coming through the pipeline. Uh, looking forward to seeing what's out there. But to be completely honest with you, the biggest thing I'm excited about is to go into 2025 the way we went into 2024. Uh, 6045 has been an early adopter of products. Um, 
and I think we we're excited to go in with what we know and uh, take that and, and expand on what we learned from last year. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, every team's got their own fit and what works for them. And a lot of the times, you know, I, I hopefully we're going to get to a point where, you know, the, the motors become so durable that we can continue to use them year in and year out, regardless of, you know, how much, you know, I, I know that might be an unpopular opinion. Some people are like, oh, you got to get new motors every year. And I hope we get to a point with the brushless era and all these new motors coming out that we can just, you know, those lower resource teams that might not have the privilege to be able to go out and buy, you know, 50 Krakens a year um, can reuse them on their, their future robots. But um, Connor, what about you guys? What's 166 happy about uh, with this latest product drop? Yeah, so I know, uh, just like what Ryan said, we're pretty anxious uh, to waiting on what Rev potentially drops within the next month. We're, we're a Rev ecosystem team. Uh, personally, I love all those uh, Swerve module options from West Coast products that mm -hmm. they have dropped. Uh, that is huge. It, now, I mean, the the COT Swerve revolution is still incredibly like young, which is wild to think about because like it's been around for only a few years. But just how far that uh, that Swerve has just developed over the past couple of years, and that it's probably only gonna like this is just the beginning. Um, uh, yeah, along just to just to piggyback off that real quick, I totally forgot the new Swerve modules. Um, Thirty three is really really excited about the new modules. Um, especially the X2S, that newer small module that um, WCP had recently come out with. That that looks to be another superior um, small platform module that's, you know, for the price that it's at, is going to compete with, um, you know, those those smaller, um, cheaper modules on the market. So sorry to mean to cut you off. I just wanted no, to no, no, absolutely. Type in there while you had it. Um, another thing that I'm really excited about uh, is what SDS dropped was their elevator bearing block kit. That thing looks sick. So we are right in the middle of our elevator uh, design with, with my CAD students. And we looked at it and we're just like, do we want to pivot to this? But we, we got to a point throughout our design. We're just like, now we just got to stick with, with what we're rocking right now. But like we're we've definitely eyed it for the for the comp season. Like this is definitely something that we would be interested in. And it's at a pretty great price for how beautiful that thing looks of every frc vendor out there they've got by far the best instagram pictures <laughs> oh yeah there you go I, it side i guess going off on a tangent on that if patrick watches this can you please post more machining videos uh, of all those parts <laughs> getting made i love that yeah another one to check out if you want to see some good uh some good machining videos fabworks has a lot of uh lasering videos on their instagram as well that's super entertaining too uh, but comment in chat from Nelson Green. Uh, I'd like to see Rev drop a larger wheeled swerve option, maybe something partially compatible with Mac Swerve for upgrading for games. It's an interesting point. Um, I forgot the Mac, you know, the only swerve module that Rev does have on the market is a three inch, I believe, is what yeah, Mac three Swerve inch. is. So um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I know West Coast is still um, pushing the four inch, I believe, SDS four inch, and then uh, West Coast, another product that I forgot to mention too. Um, the uh, I can't think of it. I just lost the name of it. One sec. I will come back to it. But um, Ryan, is there anything else that, um, you know, you had said, you know, you, 6045 is going to be looking into kind of, you know, going into 2025, 20, what they had with 2024. Is there anything that you've seen that might pique your interest um, in this latest market drop that, you know, your team would be intrigued to possibly try going into going into 2025? Yeah, I mean, we we uh, have a, a meeting every year, and it's kind of like, what what ecosystem do we want to go to? What what's our big investment for the year, right? Um, we've got, you know, we're we're a pretty well resourced team. I would say we we invest a lot into our infrastructure, and when we go a direction, we we don't necessarily have to stay that direction. Um, the kids that a, 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 they made a big basically a breakdown of hey, here here are all the motor options. Here's all the uh, pros and cons to everything. We actually haven't decided yet um, totally what we're going to do in terms of both drivetrain modules, in terms of motors. But um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's to be continued a little bit. But we're in the process of figuring that out, and I I think we've got until early December before I've got to pull the trigger and start worrying about shipping getting here before kickoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the 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 product that I was talking about was the the molded high grip. That West Coast was looking oh, at. Sure. It. Um, that was kind of looks to be a semi-competitor to the the grip lock wheels at a, a much 
more tolerable price, I guess is what I would say. The grip locks sounds like we're, um, you know, a great hit, but a little bit on the pricier range. Uh, I'd be curious to see how the that uh, that grip lock competitor that West Coast has come out with to see, you know, what that looks like and how you know performs for the community. But um, any last thoughts before we go ahead and jump into topic three? I, I'm really curious to see how that grip lock uh, wheel holds up in competition because, like, that looks because like it, the holes are oh, no, there's there's no holes that hold it in. It's just there on the hub, mm-hmm. and that's a nice, super nice uh, quick change. Is um like 166, we ran Colson's on our swerve module mainly because like we just hated having to change out that nitrile. Um, mm. where maybe well, I we haven't decided if we're gonna continue to go Colson or, or swap back to nitrile for this upcoming season, but like that's a that's a very, very enticing product there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, before we go ahead and jump into topic three, we'll go ahead and hand it over to Tyler to hear from our friends from Kettering University. Hey, thanks a lot, Nick. Yeah, Kettering University, their scholarships are now open. Uh, they're giving away a fantastic robotics scholarship for up to $5,000 per year uh, for those who attend. Do you know that every student at Kettering University actually attends a co-op program? We just brought on a new correspondent who's attending Kettering University, and they are loving it so far getting placed already with the company in their freshman year to work in that co-op thing. So if you're looking for a university that has over 30% of its attendees from competitive robotics, check out Kettering.edu slash first, learn more about what they have to offer, some of their amazing scholarships, and of course, their incredible co-op program as well. That's Kettering.edu slash first. And thanks a lot to Kettering University for their continued support. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. And thanks to our friends from Kettering University. Connor, if you're cool with it, I'm going to hand you over to topic three to cover equity, access, and resource allocation in FRC registration. I know Ryan's got um, some interesting points on this too as well, so I want to make sure Ryan gets the floor. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So this thread spawned on Chief Delphi 10 days ago by the one and only Ryan Swanson, our guest. And Ryan actually brings up a lot of great points. So uh, essentially, this is all about, you know, kind of stemmed through like that first round event selection and teams getting waitlisted and not getting into their uh into the events that they wanted and i know we had a massive issue with that in the new england region i know we had like 90 teams uh register for the same event and over 30 i think 30 percent of new england teams when it came time to second round event uh didn't even get one so um i don't I know Ryan, you've got a got a lot to say. Uh, the, the floor is yours on this one. Yeah, no, I know nothing about this topic. What are you talking about? Um, I'd like to shout out <laughs> ChatGPT Chat for making me sound smart in the initial post. Uh, hopefully, it came across that way anyway. But um, no, I, I want to say I, I had a fantastic conversation with the regional director for FRC Northland, and uh, we we talked for. Well, it's funny because I I got an email from her saying. Uh, it was titled Chief Delphi Post. And it basically read like, hey, I've been notified that you posted on Chief Delphi and a bunch of people are either you know upset or you know, got, got comments about it, right? And so she was like, well, is there a time that you can call me? And I said, yep, yeah, here's my phone number anytime. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, probably 10 minutes after that, we had a half hour conversation and uh, Nicole did an amazing job. She was totally transparent. I wanna give her all the credit in the world. Um, she shared a lot about kind of how, how things work on their end. Um, so the RDs each have their own process, if you will, for how to handle that, that, uh, the wait list, the reserve spots at an event, uh, for her, her process essentially is you, you know, round one, round two, that's RNG, totally dependent on, uh, a number that you're given within the first system. And if you've got a good number round one, it's inverted and you've got a bad number for round two. After all that clears, the RDs have total control and the RDs, uh, at least Nicole, her process was to admit teams that supply a lot of key volunteers and to admit teams who are you know, running the event or they're the host team for the event. So at the end of that, you've got, uh, there, there's typically in Minnesota 10 spots at an event that are withheld. After you admit teams that are, um, you know, providing volunteers, teams that are hosting the event, Nicole, and then her next criteria was teams that are only going to one event. Teams that, you know, through round one, through round two, haven't gotten into an event yet, they get priority to get into their local event, which is, you know, totally logical. From there, Nicole said, I've got, 
one spot at the Great Northern Regional, and I've got 14 teams going for it. I've got one spot at the Lake Superior Regional, and I've got 13 teams going for that one. And that, the true, that was true for all of the Minnesota events, more or less. So the way she handled it is she put 13 teams into an, a random number generator. And if your team popped up, you won the lottery and you got into that event. So 13 teams competing for one spot. And that was true across all of our events. Um, if you're looking or keeping track of FRC registration, you'll notice that I want to say it's five Minnesota teams signed up for an event, a regional in Alabama. That goes to show... It's it's not just Minnesota. It's literally the whole whole country. Um, we got I got two or three emails from Nicole saying, oh, you know, California might have some open spots. Um, and frankly, it was after I got that email that I was like, all right, this is this is kind of crap, and and I want I want there to be more of a public discussion about it. Uh, the points that I raised, I think the community addressed some of them. I I said, hey. Uh, do I think that that or does the community think that host teams and teams that provide key volunteers should have that preferred spot at an event? Now, there's an argument that they should if they're going to be providing volunteers, they should have to do it in round one. And like that's their event. They have to do it. Um, a lot of teams don't do that. If, if they know they've got the ability to get in round two or, or even after that because they're supplying a lot of volunteers, those teams are going to events that, that wouldn't be their number one choice, frankly, and they're using that as leverage. And, you know, there's an argument to be made that they deserve that because they're supporting the community and, and the events wouldn't run without them. And I think that's where the community landed on that topic. Uh, and I don't disagree. I, I was just throwing, a, throwing that out there for the community to kind of dissect. The other thing I brought up was, and sorry if I'm, I'm hogging the floor here, jump in whenever, but. No, keep other, going. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> The other thing I brought up was the fact that, hey, we, we have an obvious need for more events in our region. If we've got teams going to Alabama, that, that's kind of outrageous, right? And we uh, there's a lot of dynamics here. I'll try to keep it brief, but Minnesota imports about 31 teams. So some come from Wisconsin, some from Illinois. We've got a team from India, a team from China this year, uh, which is super cool. But we import about 31 teams, and we export – uh, at the time of that post was about 21 teams. So historically, we've been a net importer of teams, and we've been supporting. Hey, Tyler, if you're if you're listening, been supporting Wisconsin because uh, they have an event deficit as well. Um, so with that being said, we've got an obvious need for more events. I talked to Nicole, and I'm like, Hey, Nicole, our regional director. I was like, Hey, why why don't we have more events? We've got we've got a location in Bemidji. We've got a, a Great Northern Regional could be a double regional. And I've talked to the people who are kind of organizing this. The money is there, right? The organization, the volunteers are largely there. There's a wait list to be a key volunteer. I've been told this. I don't want to be totally held accountable to this. But I've been told that there's a wait list for certain key volunteering spots in Minnesota. So if you build it, they will come. We've got the money. And Nicole told me she's been advocating for this to happen. She's been advocating for us to get more events. And first has kind of told her no. Uh, they need to have a demand demonstrated to them. So here's me screaming to the heavens, Colin, if you're listening, we need more events. And my intention is to go to every Minnesota event, get a petition going saying, hey, we need more events. Here's the demand. Uh, let us have it. We'll make it work. No, for sure. And, uh, and what's, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. What's going on in New England this year? I know uh, what one of the goals was to try and get um, a an FRC event in every state within New England, all six states. And for the first time, that's actually happening. We have an FRC event in the state of Vermont uh, for the first time in ever. So, which is really cool. However, it's the same amount of events from last year, which means an event somewhere got killed off, and. Unfortunately, so two of the events that got killed off was North Shore and Southeast Mass, which cater to ge uh, geographically the two largest areas of New England first. Um, so uh, we're like, when we saw that list on 166, when we saw that come out, we're like, oh, there's going to be a lot of displacement and a lot of not so happy people, which uh, for, for the Vermont teams and for the, uh, for the main teams who got a second event for this year, Hats off to them because now they have events that are a lot more closer to home. So those teams that typically have to drive 
three, four hours plus and have to get hotels for every single event, they now have the opportunity to potentially just do a day trip, which I love. However, it, and this is no disrespect to those teams. It completely, it just the, the, or the equality for or equity, equality words are hard. Um, it doesn't, it kind of goes in the back in a, in a backwards direction almost because now there, there's a lot of teams that were going to those two events that were there since basically the inception of the New England district. And now they're like, oh, crap, I have to go and find another event. Does this mean that I have to travel further? Do I need to get hotels now? Did I plan like we don't do we have enough money in our team's expenses for the year to be able to do this? Oh, no. Chat, are we cooked? Um, and yeah, this- that. I, I don't uh, what is, is there a similar situation going on in Michigan, Nick? Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, so Michigan obviously does it differently than most, right? You, you get signed your home event. And I know that's not super particular to across the world, but basically in Michigan, it works. You get assigned a home event because there's so many events. I think we're up to, you know, I think weeks one through five, we're at six events and week two is the only one that we have four, I think it was the last time I checked. But so every team gets assigned a home, home event. And if you sign up for that home event in the first round, you get that no matter what, like hundred percent, you're going to get your home event. And then round two, you submit with what you have. And like Ryan said, if you get the magic number, you're in. And if not, you get put on a wait list and basically they're going to hold out um, to make sure that the rookies get their events. And then after that, it's, what number are you on the wait list? And that's how you're going to get assigned. So usually they're pretty good about it. Um, you know, we've got some new events this year, some continuous ones. I know Troy's back down to one event after being two the past couple of years. So we'll see how, you know, that, that shakes up. I'm curious to see, you know, where it moves forward. But um, the one thing that I do want to highlight to Ryan's point and Tyler had put it in chat. I don't know that Wisconsin districts are going to solve the problem because to Ryan's point, like, yeah, there's there's Wisconsin teams that come to Minnesota Regional, so one would think, well, if Wisconsin has their districts, those spots are removed. Well, not really, because we're taking away three regionals in Wisconsin because now they're going to move to districts. So in reality, geographically, it's just we're moving more options for Minnesota teams to go right next door and have to go down to Alabama. So, like, to Ryan's point, like, there has to be some sort of happy medium, and I don't think that – Wisconsin moving to districts is really going to solve the problem. Um, and if anything, in my opinion, it actually might make it worse. Um, so I've, I've run the numbers on that. It's, it's about neutral and okay. slightly, slightly helpful. Very, very slightly helpful. Um, geographically, for those who don't know, the Seven Rivers Regional is right across the border. It might as well be a Minnesota uh, event. And actually, the foundations of it were uh, from Team 2977, who is a Minnesota team. Mm-hmm. you know, help to start that event. So um, it's in La Crosse, Wisconsin, right on the border of Wisconsin, Minnesota, heavily populated by Minnesota teams typically. And uh, losing that effectively negates the the net benefit of uh, Wisconsin going to district. So it's roughly neutral for all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. Well, good to know. All right. Well, before we go ahead and jump into our final topic of the night, let's go ahead and bring Tyler on to start our giveaway. Before we get back to this video, we'd like to thank Animark for their continued support of fun content. Go to Animark.com for your one-stop shop for all your box competition needs. Featuring over 200 years of combined experience, Animark has now been in business for over 20 years servicing first teams and beyond. From electrical and mechanical, anything you may need, go to Animark.com to see how they can help your team and to get some of the best quality parts and superior service that your team deserves. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler, and thanks again to our friends at Animark. All right, jumping into our final topic of the night, um, issues with the Impact Award. Um, Ryan, I'm going to let you take the lead on here. I know we you might have got winded from the previous topic, but I know that um, you know, you're know you super passionate about this one as well. So I'll go ahead and throw it to you, and then uh, we'll go ahead and bounce off you. Hey, I'm good at nothing if not spewing my opinions on the internet. <laughs> so, I'm here for it. Um, no, the Impact Award. So originally, I think we were going to talk about bumpers, and then the Impact thread blew up today. And I think it's a really relevant topic and a topic that I feel pretty strongly about. Uh, my background is on a team, uh, 4607, who, you know, had a lot of success with the former Chairman's Award, now Impact Award, uh, and is still doing a fantastic job in that respect. 
Uh, and I'm on a team now who, you know, has has aspirations of winning that award in the future, right? Um, that thread is from a Hall of Fame team, a recent Hall of Fame team, 321, um, a member from their team, I should say. And they bring up a lot of good points, and there's a ton of good discussion. Um, I think Mike Schreiber had my favorite uh, my favorite post in there. He uh, he posted the Dwight or no, it's the the office gif where they're describing what a pyramid scheme is. So the the impact award is viewed by many as a pyramid scheme. It's the teams who start the most first teams. And while you've got teams that you know are doing crazy cool stuff, yeah, there you go. I love it. Um, yeah, so what is a pyramid scheme? There you go. Um, essentially, while you've got teams who are doing crazy cool stuff outside the co the constructs of first, uh, the teams who do things like start FLL teams, FTC teams, et cetera, seem to be the teams that, that benefit from the impact award. To me, the biggest topic I would like to address within that would be the fact that you've got you've got teams doing crazy cool things, right? Year after year, and they'll get feedback from the judges saying, oh, that you did that last year. You did the same thing last year. You only impacted millions of people the same way you did last year, right? Yeah, and I'll so pause you right teams, there real yeah. quick. Right to that point, how has 118 not won the championship impact award yet? And I will die on this grave. What is it going to take? They literally design an every bot to completely assist all of the low resource teams or teams that might want to use it as a stepping stone to be able to enter the program and have now done it for FTC. They did one for FTC this year, which in my opinion might be even a bigger impact than the FRC one because of the ages that impact FTC. Like, I don't know what more it's going to take, but 118 needs to get into the hall of fame. Ryan continue. Nick, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'll give you another example. 1678 Citrus Circuits yep. um, was, I heard from one of their mentors today making an argument that, you know, hey, th their programs have grown exponentially. They've grown so much. And uh, they're at the point now where they're, they're maintaining. They can't reasonably do more because they're at capacity, because they're doing so much. And they're being punished for that. They're being, uh, the feedback they're getting from judges effectively is, you're not doing more than you did last year when they're, they're doing so much more than everybody else. Right. So there, there's a, a balance here, right? I understand wanting new teams to win the impact award, right? You, you don't want to make it so impossible to win that, you know, citrus wins every year, 118 wins every year, what have you. Um, but on the other hand, we do need to reward these teams who are doing incredible things with incredible consistency, even if they're not growing. I agree with you both, and I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, so 166, we are an impact-heavy team. Uh, we have won it at the district qualifying level the past three years, one of them being at district champs. Uh, what we have noticed is uh, throughout all that and throughout our judging stuff, and while, while you guys say, like, yes, they're, they're like 118 and 1678, they're doing a crap ton of work. Yes, I absolutely agree. However, I mean, granted, I'm not on 118 or 1678, but it's also all about how you how you portray that and how you like throughout your essay and through your impact presentation to the judges. So like, yes, we see a lot of awesome, great things that they do on social media, posting the every bot, hosting all these camps, starting up all these teams. And while you also have to be able to Put that down on paper and be able to present that. And I'm, I'm also not saying that they don't do that well. I'm yeah. sure they do very, very well. I would love to be able to be an impact finalist. Mm -hmm. Hell, I'd love to win it at, at the championship. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so I know with 166 uh, from 23 to 24, like we, so we won impact at our district championship in 2023. We did a lot of stuff in 2024. We also did a lot of stuff, but one thing that uh, that we've seen that we've tended to notice from impact judges, especially if it's consistent from from event to event and year to year, is that they're going to know what kind of stuff you're doing based off of when they judged you previously and, and stuff. Granted, that shouldn't necessarily be taken into account, but they're going to know like how you're progressing throughout the entire thing. Oh boy, this video. <laughs> um, so 
like we like so at the end of the 2024 season we knew we need like if we want to like granted winning winning the award is never the end goal it should always be about how do you make this how do you leave this world in a better place but we knew that if we wanted to you know have uh have impact be our shot at getting back to the world championship is that we need to do a crap ton more stuff and and how and how do we do it and then how do we portray it and just getting a bunch of people involved, like trying to get your local politicians involved and what can you do? Uh, we've, we're doing a lot of things that are kind of on brand with the season and with our team this year. So like Chop Shop, we're, we're car racing themed, checkered flags and stuff. We started, ho- uh, this past summer, we started hosting an annual Cars and Coffee uh, car show. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, did a, we, we, part- we partnered with the Blue Ocean Society to do an ocean cleanup uh, to be very on brand with this year. Uh, it's all about what can it, this is, I guess this has kind of been used in NFL and I don't want to use that this as like a one-to-one comparison, but like the ongoing thing from like players and coaches is what have you done for me recently? And it's, it's all about what are you doing next? What's next? Yes. Continue with what you're doing, uh, from year to year. That's fantastic. Keep doing that but can you add more and how do you, and how do you portray it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I mean, I get where you're coming from. um, But to Ryan's point, and I don't, I don't want you to think I'm arguing with you about it because I'm not, but Mm -hmm. to, you know, be devil's advocate to your point, when you have as many kids on your team as Citrus and 118 does, and they're already doing so much and you're at capacity and can't do more. Like where there's gotta be, you know, there's got to be a happy medium of recognizing the ongoing efforts and then just having to completely pivot to win an award. You know what I mean? So I, I think we're saying the same thing. I, I, I agree with, yeah. you know, what you said too, but. Um, uh, also know, keep in mind, it's not just you competing against yourself. You're, there's also a bunch of other teams in your area that are also competing for this award. So mm-hmm. it's, it's like, yeah, you can be doing a lot, but maybe. It's like, yeah, you're going into the gym at 630 because you want to be the best, but maybe someone's going into the gym at six. Mm-hmm. No, that's fair. Ryan, any any final thoughts? I know we kind of cut you off in the middle of your uh, your spiel. No, so if you don't if you don't cut me off, I'll keep going. So that was great. Um, <laughs> what I what I tell my kids on the team and what if I were to type a reply to that thread, it would effectively be, you know, we do cool stuff because it impacts our community because it builds our program and makes us more sustainable and a better program. Uh, we do cool stuff because we like doing cool stuff. We're going to submit for it if we've got kids who are, who are interested in going through that process. And if we pick up an award on the way, you know, more power to us. That's, uh, you know, gravy on top, basically. We're doing it because we enjoy it. We're never going to be one of those teams who, you know, they do a thing to win the award. And I think part of the challenge is that it's such an all or nothing benefit especially in the regional system, right? It's, it's one of four automatic spots going to the world championship. It's an all or nothing incentive. And it'd be really cool. I think the district system handles it better um, to provide benefit to teams who are doing cool stuff through other awards. And you get points for qualifying in the district system. Uh, yep. Now in the new regional qualification system, you get some of that. But um, the fact that it's such all or nothing um, really makes it a challenge, I think, for teams to, well, really, it's incentive to embellish. It's incentive to do things that, you know, maybe aren't gracious professional. I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I got you. I get it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to FRC Roundup. Special thanks to all those who clicked that subscribe button or stepped up to help fund by becoming a fund member or supporter by clicking that join button. Your support really helps us continue to make great content. Don't forget, you can watch FRC Roundup archived at Fun Robotics Network on YouTube and watch live Mondays during the competition season. Thank you to Ryan, our guest, for coming on tonight. And on behalf of our producer, Tyler Olds, my co-host, Connor, and all fun correspondents, I'm Nick Jr., and thanks for watching. Big, th- big thanks to our moderators in chat as well. See you next time where we take a look at what is going on with First Robotics on FRC Roundup. Thanks, everyone. Streams on the Fun Robotics Network are supported by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. 
Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotics scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions.